Hello, my name's Paul Conway and I'm a subject librarian in the Library Learning and Teaching team at Sheffield Hallam University. Catherine Cousimo is the Disability Support Advisor in Computing and Library Services at the University of Huddersfield. Catherine and I currently co-chair the Northern Collaboration Enabling Group and together we've created this presentation. There are 14 slides and I'm going to talk to you for around 20 minutes. So the content of this presentation will consist of an introduction to the work of the enabling group, uh, details of the group's benchmarking survey and report, and our future plans. I'll conclude with some contact details, so if you'd like to, you can get in touch with us. Representing the Northern Collaborations member institutions, the enabling group consists of library staff with the responsibilities for, or an interest in, providing inclusive and accessible library services and resources. The group was formed in March 2014 to facilitate a sharing of best practice, knowledge and experience. And we keep in touch by using the Northern Collaboration Enabling GISC mail group and through meetings. These meetings are well attended and they're held twice a year. Topics discussed recently uh, include web accessibility, sensory rooms, provision of alternative formats and accessibility of online materials. The enabling group also acts in an advisory capacity for Northern Collaboration projects on accessibility issues as required. If you want to find out more about the enabling group, there's a link to our website at the top of this slide and I'll show this internet address again at the end of the presentation. When the enabling group was founded, one of its primary aims was to provide an opportunity to share best practice. And since it began, the group has undertaken small-scale benchmarking projects on specific aspects of inclusive library support, uh, such as the Alternative Format Survey. But no comprehensive overview of the support for disabled students provided by the member institutions had been attempted. So it seemed a fitting way to mark five years of the group's existence for us to carry out a large-scale benchmarking survey covering a wide range of elements involved in inclusive library support. For the content of the survey, there were several existing models we could draw upon. So the Open Rose Group, um, which is from 2003 to 2018, it was in many ways the precursor of the enabling group and it consisted of members working in disability support from Yorkshire-wide libraries. And the Open Rose Group had carried out its own benchmarking survey soon after it was founded and we had access to this. And this in turn was based on an existing model provided by the Claude Group based in the southwest of England. Other surveys, including a Scottal Accessibility Audit, were also used to formulate the questions for the enabling group's example. So this was presented to the enabling group at one of our regular meetings. Various questions were updated, new suggested examples were adopted, and the finalised version of the survey was agreed by the membership. There was a very positive response to the survey with 14 completed surveys from the 16 member institutions submitted by the deadline of the end of January 2020. The survey was administered using Google Forms, a free survey collection software. This was chosen because it allowed the responses to be collated automatically into a spreadsheet, saving a great deal of time for Catherine and me as the survey organisers. One drawback of using Google Forms was that the respondents were unable to attach documents when they were filling in their answers, and they ended up having to send their attachments separately. But overall we felt that Google Forms was an effective means of collecting the data. The results of the survey were written up, were written up in a report, and we're going to share a link to the contents of this report on the group's website.
The Enabling Group's benchmarking survey contains 61 questions divided into seven sections. So these sections are uh, University Context, the Library Service, Staff Training, Student Experience, focusing on learning and teaching, Information and Communications Technology and Assistive Technology, Physical Environment and Building Design, and finally a more open-ended section where members of the group could highlight examples of good practice within their libraries. So we'll now have a look at each of the survey sections in a bit more detail. University context. All member institutions have a policy or policies in place covering accessibility or disability support, usually under the umbrella of equality and diversity or inclusion, and therefore broader than just disability focused. The number of students at universities ranges from 8,500 to over 39,000. The proportion of those reporting a disability varies widely uh, between 3.2% and 18% of the total student body with an average of 12.8%. By contrast, the data on numbers of staff disclosing a disability is less readily available, and those numbers are much lower, with an average among those who responded to this question of less than 5% of the total workforce. This presumably reflects the relative, or perceived, a lack of support for staff uh, compared to what is offered for students, considering that the proportion of the UK working age population with a disability is around 19% according to the Department for Work and Pensions. Library service. Many libraries have staff for whom disability support is not their only or main responsibility. Those with a full-time disability support officer are very much in the minority. One approach is to aim for mainstreaming support so all staff can take responsibility for its provision. Despite limitations on resources, there's a strong customer-focused ethos among all members. For example, most offer at least some degree of support to external members on an ad hoc basis and provide library leaflets in a variety of alternative formats if requested. Although all member libraries have web pages dedicated to disability support, as a rule, the first place a student learns of the library support available is from the disability team when a support plan is created. Good communication and links between the departments are therefore crucial. Many agree that although student feedback is very useful, it's not always easy to obtain. Focus groups are not well regarded overall. So establishing better ways of gaining this feedback, possibly through UX or via disabled student networks, is a future project for the enabling group to consider. Staff training. There's a varied approach to support for disabled students among the member libraries. Some have a named member of staff with responsibility of this area, for example, a disability support officer, inclusive learning manager, or learning support officer, disability and dyslexia. Some have this responsibility as an add-on to their other library roles, while others have adopted a more mainstream strategy ensuring that library staff liaise with disabled student support for advice. Some aspects of support are carried out by specific library teams, while awareness of disability issues is ensured in some cases by the mandatory use of online training packages. Services and facilities provided out of core hours vary. Some member libraries offer access to specific rooms, while others rely on various subject areas, study skills, referencing, etc., with an aim to develop improved signposting to provide clarity as to what is available and when. In many libraries, security staff can help out of core hours with book retrieval, photocopying and printing, and so on. The inclusion of disability awareness as part of staff inductions is not uniform. Some libraries offer it as part of the standard induction for all new members of library staff, while in other libraries it is offered but not mandatory. 
Some libraries offer disability awareness training to frontline staff only. In another instance, training is delivered via online packages. In one case, all new library staff are required to complete their university's equality and diversity module and knowledge is tested via a series of quizzes. Updates in staff training are not offered routinely, though at some libraries it is offered if a need is identified by library staff. Most member libraries don't provide disability awareness training for non-library staff, though some offer one-to-one -one training sessions for academics. Other libraries provide training to members of their student service, disability tutors and disability advice team, support workers, student mentors, study skills tutors, specialist mentors, etc., academic staff and any university staff who attend university-wide sessions, all delivered through a people development team. Some aspects of disability awareness are included in online material. For example, subject librarians include information on accessible reading lists in their inductions for new academic staff. Students are kept up to date in developments in library disability support by various means. These include staff student meetings attended by librarians, web, play, web pages, a news blog and social media. Student experience learning and teaching. Some libraries offer students a separate induction to the library including a tour and some contribute to events organised outside the library. For example, freshers events for students with disabilities and study ready taster sessions. Others rely on their disabled student support team to introduce students to the library services and resources via the web pages. All libraries offer one-to-ones on request, including an introduction to library services and resources and an optional tour. Several libraries ensure their teaching sessions are accessible and they have modified their teaching materials to ensure they are accessible. Also, some have changed their visual identity so it can be read by screen reading software. Most libraries make their files and other materials available in advance of the session, some making this part of library policy. Microphones are used in one case for larger teaching groups. Coloured paper is widely used for handouts where required. In other libraries, accessibility in teaching sessions has not been formalised. In one instance, note-taking software is available on campus-based machines, although there's investigation into whether this can be made available off-campus. Students who attend skills workshops in some libraries are able to declare their disability and any associated requirements on a booking form prior to attending the session, so adjustments can be made. These could include the use of roving microphones, slowing the pace of the session, providing handouts, presentations, associated materials in different font types and sizes, printing on pastel paper, provided in advance or during the session. Several libraries offer extensive guidelines on how to provide accessible teaching materials, support for making teaching accessible via lecture capture, and how materials can be requested in different formats. Additional support services for disabled students on campus include uh, alternative formats, book retrieval service, accessible study rooms and photocopying and printing. Off-campus support at most libraries includes postal loans, online chat and webinars. The accessibility of catalogues and database gateways are covered by the library systems or IT teams or in some cases the customer services staff. Most member libraries have an alternative format service or if not they use RNIB or an on-campus transcription service. While none have a formal service standard all transactions are dealt with as a priority. It's difficult to set a fixed time to complete transactions due to reliance on others, for example alt format providers and publishers. The alt format service is provided by a variety of teams in different institutions, for example disability support, library resources, customer services, collection administrators, reading lists and digitisation teams. In many instances the service involves the input of several different teams. 
Most libraries don't have a formal assistive practice in the purchase of media items. In some transcriptions can be provided on request. Some buy DVDs with subtitled and audio descriptions as part of library policy, and some add subtitles to all videos produced in-house. Information and Communications Technology and Assistive Technology There's widely varying provision of software, resources, specialist equipment and support among the member libraries. Information technology, or IT, support is offered in several different ways, with most members mentioning an IT help desk providing phone, email and face-to-face -face assistance, as well as web forms and chat in some organisations. Support for assistive software, where it exists, is provided most often by IT departments, but also disability teams, SPLD, Specific Learning Difficulty Tutors, or in a couple of instances, designated staff, such as the Assistive Technology Advisor or Learning Support Officer. There is widespread awareness of the new Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG 2.1, international accessibility standards and most member organizations are working towards compliance with these although commonly this is university-wide rather than the responsibility of library staff. All but two of the libraries offer specialist equipment areas or rooms with a minimum of provision being some assistive software and height adjustable desks. The baseline level of software provision is usually one of the study skills packages plus a mind mapping package with a range of other software supporting VI users and dictation or note-taking support. Some member libraries offer a variety of other resources from ergonomic keyboards and mice to daylight lamps, document stands, dictaphones and even study skills books. The questionnaire didn't go into more detail on some complex issues relating to IT, for example, the ethics of segregating students with additional needs from their peers, how well the resources are used, there's no consistent collection of usage stats among members, and how to ensure that the, uh, met the uh, resources are maintained or still relevant. For example, have certain equipment such as CCTV units or voice recorders become obsolete with the widespread use of apps designed to achieve the same end? So these are all issues that the group may wish to investigate at a later date. Physical environment and building design. In most cases, all students have the same access options to building libraries, with the exception of some listed buildings where alternative access routes are required. All libraries have adapted workspaces for disabled students with height adjustable desks on every floor and in various workspaces such as group work areas and quiet and silent study areas. Signage varies from library to library. Digital signage is used in most libraries and some have digital navigation maps available on request. Most libraries are keen to do more work in this area, for example producing tactile and audio signage for example. This section didn't include consideration of the library environment for autistic users and members will want to remedy this omission by benchmarking this important area of provision in the future. Highlighting good practice. The good working relationship between library teams and other departments, in particular university-wide disability services, is highly valued by a number of respondents to the survey and is considered crucial for building an inclusive environment for students. There is reference to pockets of inclusive practice throughout organisations. Effective communication among teams can help to spread awareness of this. Accessibility is considered by at least one library member as part of the process of implementing new services. Accessibility checks of visual and teaching material carried out with the involvement of a disabled staff member were singled out as important and could be a model for others to investigate. There is recognition of the importance of creating an inclusive learning and teaching environment in which all staff take responsibility for supporting disabled students. One response highlighted the value of membership of the enabling group 
and the sharing of best practice when working towards this goal. Future plans. Future plans of the enabling group include sharing the findings of the survey within the membership institutions and beyond. Several key issues raised in the report, such as how to obtain effective feedback, the provision of assistive technology, and the consideration of the library environment for autistic users will, I'm sure, be discussed in future meetings of the enabling group. The group plans to carry out benchmarking surveys on a regular basis, either on specific issues or on a broader level. So that concludes this presentation. I hope you found it informative and helpful. If you want to find out more about the survey, the report or the other work of the enabling group, please do contact Catherine or me via our details on this slide. Also included on here once again is a reminder of the group's internet address. So thank you very much for listening and enjoy the rest of the conference.